Well, ladies and gentlemen, our last session, last but not least, AI in the agency. We, we, we say we all need it, but how do we do it? Do we make use of ChatGPT in, in the agency, giving all the data into the Azure cloud at Microsoft? When we designate Microsoft to be a company that is subject to Section 19A, do we do that in the cloud, in the Microsoft cloud? I guess not. So how do we make use of AI? What is the future for AI? I guess we all believe as agencies we will need AI starting um, with uh, statements by the companies of hundreds of pages. Olivier Gerson always says, well, in order to separate the noise from the substance in the future, we will need AI to look at these papers. So, how do we do that? Um, a power talk that will be led by Thibaut uh, Schrippe, associate professor at the Freie Universität Amsterdam. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but not, well. not too badly. <laughs> and a faculty affiliate at Stanford University. So, Thibaut, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I must say I'm very honored to be here. Uh, thank you very much for a very well-balanced conference. I've learned a lot. It was very inspiring. Um, with this panel, we have four objectives. Objective number one is very personal. It's for me not to lose my voice entirely. Um, so please you know, give me some empathy in case that happens. I do have a glass of water. Objective number two, quite a few panels made references to ours as you know, the saviors and the only solution possible. So we have now to deliver on that and explain how indeed we can make competition law work. Objective number three being the last panel is of course for us to be entertaining. So no worries, I'm sure they have full stack of jokes ready to be told. Uh, we tried our best. And objective number four, the most important of course, is to be on time. Uh, now we started late, 23. <laughs> So you can count on us to finish late, but I don't know if that is a thing, but right late, right? So at uh, 53, or maybe even before that, we try to be, to be finished. Um, it is indeed not a big panel. We always talk about big tech. The other ones were big panels. We are the good guys uh, because we are the small panel. Um, I have two speakers with me. On my left, on my, sorry, on my right, your left, uh, Acor Sia, she is the Chief Executive and Commissioner of the Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore, which I will refer to as the CCCS. And on her right, uh, Ioannis Sianos, former President of the Hellenic Competition Commission, the HCC, member of the Competition uh, appeal tribunal and professor of competition law at UCL, University College London. Now, um, I won't take long to talk about the subject. The only thing I want to say is that uh, you may give it different names. I will call that computational antitrust. It doesn't really matter. The good news is that the subject is not new. As you will hear, you can indeed build on past experiences. And we also have literature that we can build on. Um, to see if indeed we can already give agencies some tools and explore what agencies are doing. Um, we have created a project at Stanford University called Computational Antitrust with 67 competition agencies working on those issues. And I must say that this was created in 2020. The objective at the time was to convince agencies that AI and other computational tools could be helpful. I think we passed that. And most agencies are now convinced that Somehow they have to use it, which doesn't mean that you can do it all and that there are no issues. So we are here to discuss all that. Uh, the format of the panel will be the following. I ask them for very short answers, and I must say that I'm worried when I see the big pile that you have over here. Um, but the goal is to make it as dynamic as possible, as we just heard from the last panel. Dynamism is important. Uh, so I will be limiting them to three-minute answers. In case they pass that, I will <clears throat> clear my voice this way, which may also help me. Um, and then we can proceed. And toward the very end, for the grande finale, I have a surprise question. They are not aware of it. I hope they're scared. Um, and I'm, I'm already uh, excited about the answer they may give. All right. We divide the, the discussion in two different parts. 
part one, we thought we'll make it as concrete as possible and talk about tools that agencies are using or could be using. And the first kind of tools that you may use are the tools for agencies to monitor the market. So in a sense, to go out there and identify practices. As you see on the program, there is a reference to leniency applications being on the decline, so agencies have to be more proactive. So what can you do? And I will start with you with the very first question. Uh, your agency, uh, under your leadership, is um, using computational tools when it comes to bid rigging, uh, detection, and document similarity tools. So could you, again, in about three minutes, give us an expose of uh, what you're doing in this space? Thank you, Thibault. I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, Andres and the Buddhist uh, Katalum for inviting me. It's really an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, so as Thibault said, not only are we a small panel, I would say that uh, the CCCS is also a small agency, uh, and there's only about 75 of us. Uh, we do have competition and consumer protection functions, but we're not otherwise a regulator of any specific sector. Uh, so we therefore only collect case-specific data. We have no time series data. So when you talk about big data, we have to look around and see what other parts of government do they have sort of good data sets on which we can build our computational tools. Uh, so we are quite lucky in that the Ministry of Finance in Singapore uh, has for a long time required uh, tenders in government tenders, tenderers to submit through a platform. And there are prices for line items as well as information, good structured data on winning and losing bids. And the good thing is there's commonality of interest, right? The Ministry of Finance wants value for money and we want to prevent bid rigging. Uh, so we build our tool on the data, the good sort of public procurement data, and we call it the bid rigging detection tool. Uh, now, the bid rigging detection tool uh, uses rule-based algorithms and several sort of screening data uh, to sort of use several indicators to flag out what may be suspicious tenders. Uh, so typical screening indicators would be the number of uh, bidders, their frequency of participation, their win-loss ratios, and whether there are any suspicious pricing patterns. So the distance between the various bids, whether they are outlier winning bids. Uh, so I'll be first to confess that uh, this sort of tool, the screening tool, that flags out suspicious tenders or sp suspicious uh, industries uh, is useful where there's no prior evidence of bid rigging. Uh, so for agencies which may be interested in finding out whether their sector uh, is susceptible to bid rigging conduct, I think that is quite a useful tool. And what it does for us is it increases the coverage, right? It allows us for a small agency uh, to cover quite a lot of tenders over quite a number of years and uh, be quite sensitive to the suspicious tenders. Uh, so I think that is more like a top-down approach. Uh, and recently, we've also adapted it up, uh, adapted the tool to apply to cases where we actually know about individual companies that suspected of bid rigging, and we apply the tool to see how widespread that conduct might be and whether it extends to other tenders, how long uh, the conduct might extend. Uh, so we have uh, this bit rigging detection tool that uh, throws up suspicious tenders. Then typically the next step would be to go to the uh, procurement agencies to ask them for the tender documents. Now that can be very, very voluminous. And that was what led us to uh, uh, go on and build uh, a document comparison similarity tool. Now, the tool, the document similarity tool, uh, uses natural language processing algorithms to compare the documents. So rather than having human eyes compare documents and find out whether the tender documents are similar, uh, the tool uses sort of forward segments to compare whether the documents are actually similar and then highlight the documents which then the case officers can look at. So again, you know, it really saves a lot of man hours pouring through the documents that might come through. And we've actually applied it to actual cases to really cut down on the manpower required to process. Um, so I would say that actually uh, none of this you would notice actually involves so-called AI in the true sense of uh, supervised machine learning. And I think our limitation is really uh, the lack of comprehensive sort of data sets that are labeled as to which are anti-competitive and which are competitive, right? So um, I, 
the way we see it, I think if the technology is such that we can train the algorithm on a small set of labeled data that is uh, anti-competitive, yeah. right, and to sort of come up with a predictive model, uh, that would be good. The other solution is to have an international cartel of all authorities coming together to share data sets so that we can build uh, a good tool. Yeah, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. So a lot of what you will hear today is that indeed, these kind of tools can be deployed within small agencies, big agencies, and they are different, they require a different level of expertise, right? It could go from pretty much no background in computer science, NLP is more advanced, and you could even go and develop some more tools, but it's not just something for the bigger competition agencies in the world. What you say goes so well with my surprise question, I'm very excited. Uh, but Ioannis, I will now move to you. Uh, so you've been doing a lot of work uh, when it comes to the Hellenic competition um, agency. Um, and I think you want to talk about subtech. If you're not familiar with the term, it stands for supervisory technologies. So again, in about three minutes, Thank you, give uh, us an overview. Thank you very much, uh, Thibault. I hope you can hear me well. So uh, thank you first to Andreas and the Bundeskanzler Catalan for the invitation. Of course, the views uh, that I will express are uh, only personal, personal views. So, um, and I guess, you know, we heard yesterday from Christina, uh, but also Susanna Zubov has done a lot of work on the surveillance capitalism. And in order to deal with surveillance capitalism, we need supervisory technology, uh, also from the point of view of uh, competition authorities. And there I will say, um, Computational, computational law uh, and economics, if I use the term that uh, Thibault uh, mentioned before, has two elements in a way. The first one is how we go from code is law to law is code. So basically how we are able to promote uh, this, uh, uh, compliance by design. Uh, and that will be one way to think about the problem, uh, thinking about the interoperability, for instance, requirements that we have in the DMA and how they can be entrenched into the code uh, uh, that the companies are using. Uh, and this is a little bit what Sir Marcus mentioned before as well. And then we have the surveillance technology, how we can monitor basically the markets, how we can use our code to monitor better uh, markets, in particular uh, early detection basically of anti-competitive types of conduct. So um, in that context, of course, competition is not something, you know, uh, it's not new. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's technology, supervisory technology has mostly been used by financial regulators mm -hmm. in order to ensure compliance. So we're not really like reinventing the wheel. It's something that yeah. financial regulators have been doing a little bit longer than, than, uh, than we have been doing. Uh, and of course, you know, the idea is not just to supervise the, the markets. Uh, and our initiatives so far have been, and what actually, uh, the Singaporean Authority also mentioned before was about supervising and monitoring markets, procurement markets in that context, but we can also think about automated monitoring of remedies as well as the next frontier for surveillance uh, technology. Now what we've done in the uh, HCC, which is actually a small uh, authority, uh, is first to develop some form of holistic strategy about how we can transform ourselves to an AI and haste or augmented type of authority. Of authority. And, and in order to do that, we uh, drafted a, a inception report in 2020, looking a little bit to the experience of a number of other jurisdictions, but also other regulators, in order to see how we can design the process of transformation. Secondly, you need to get the right people. So we uh, started a position of uh, chief data scientists with a team of five um, uh, people, like three uh, data scientists and two computer scientists, that help us somehow um, promote this, uh, this transformation. And thirdly, I think we, we had uh, the opportunity to um, be able to use uh, resources, in particular data. Uh, the, uh, the Greek government, um, in, during the COVID crisis, because of the uh, supermarkets were the only you know, stores, grocery stores that were open, they develop a app that was collecting prices from supermarkets daily, which were part of the database. So uh, when they send us this proposal to review it uh, from the competition perspective, we said, well, that's okay, but we need to have access to that data. Uh, and therefore, that's how we develop basically this uh, data uh, platform, the data analytics and economic intelligence platform, which uh, is, it collects this data from an API, open uh, API, uh, and uh, reviews this data with a number of 
tests, uh, in particular, you know, structural break type of tests, to uh, review, uh, for instance, possible, you know, uh, cartelization or uh, excessive uh, prices. And this is data that we have data, uh, daily data uh, for 2,200 products. Um, and time series basically have started being uh, compiled. Uh, and at the same time, this platform, uh, which uh, also uses uh, a natural language uh, actual models in order to be more dynamic, because of course there are new products coming in, and we don't want to do that manually, so it's getting autom uh, automated. So natural language processing is used. And then you know, we develop different dashboards which enable the various uh, agents uh, to, that use this particular type of platform to uh, put in different parameters, to uh, put in different counterfactuals, look to uh, various prices for a similar type of goods or goods that could be into the same uh, product uh, market category. Um, and, and this actually tool helped us a lot in order to target our down rates. So we're able basically to identify situations in which we saw some abnormal type of behavior. Um, and, and in this case, we actually systematize uh, our down rate. So we, we had uh, this possibility. Now, we expanded this platform now to be able to extract uh, systematic data from various e-shops. And now we have more than 61,700 61, products daily information about prices, and for some products also, like fisheries, information about quantity. Mm -hmm. So this is really uh, you know, constituting this time series, enabling our uh, monitoring of markets unit to be able to look more closely. Uh, and this is done automatically because uh, basically you can, we can uh, get information on uh, SKU codes or barcodes, uh, look to discounts, uh, look to um, uh, different types of promotion campaigns, because our, um, our algorithms are able basically to, uh, to get images as well and, and be able to understand the images, for instance, for different types of, uh, of offerings. So this is, a, I think it created a revolution at the authority somehow, and uh, I think the staff were extremely excited to look to the results of this, uh, and my concern was how we can make these, this team of data scientists being integrated at the authority, how, uh, the uh, lawyers and economists uh, will be able to interact with them. And I was very pleasantly surprised because when they saw the results, when they saw this amount of data we were collecting, I mean, many of the economists in different uh, departments uh, were extremely interested to, to ask. Now, for, from then on, we can develop a little bit more uh, some other types of, um, of initiatives. For instance, when I left the, um, at the authority in January, we were thinking about initiative of monitoring um, uh, social, uh, social networks um, uh, in terms of getting information out of, um, of social networks with regards to the public, of course, with the old, co old company updates or accounting reports or investor updates uh, for eventual uh, behavior and the competitive uh, behavior. And in our law, we have a specific provision about price signaling. Uh, which is quite interesting um, a provision, and therefore this type of analysis of back declarations of various uh, CEOs uh, in the media, etc., is very important because that's basically the evidence you need in order to implement <coughs> this price signal. Can I stop you here because it goes with my surprise question? Oh, so you'll okay. be able Sorry to, for that. to I, fit it in. All right. Okay. Um, so okay. So there is one. So there is one thing you can do. You go out there. You collect, identify potential practices. Something else then is how you can use those tools in order to review the data, the evidence that you may have, right? And so, again, I'll go to you first. Um, I know you've been developing skills and computational tools when it comes to uh, complaint analytics. So can you please tell us in just two minutes about that? Uh, so in Singapore, c consumer complaints go to the Consumer Association of Singapore. Uh, which is the first port of call for consumers with disputes uh, with suppliers. Uh, so we worked quite closely with the Consumer Association. They strip the data of uh, personal data and they forward the information to us. And because, you know, rather than have a human sort of go through the complaints and try to make sense of the complaints, uh, we built a complaints analytics tool, which uses, again, natural language processing and machine learning techniques to have a topic clustering uh, tool. So it goes through the complaints and it clusters the complaints into common themes. And then we can look at the common themes and see if there are trends in the consumer complaints and whether there are any further areas for investigation. So again, you know, it just reduces manpower that's required to sort of sense make what is happening. 
what we have not quite done, but actually is a possible adaptation of the tool, is to apply the tool to a very document-intensive investigation to try to sort of make high-level sense of the pool of documents in investigation. Yeah, thank you very much. And so if you've never looked at topic clustering, it's not only useful, but it also be it, it is beautiful. So just Google that or use another search engine. Anyway, um, the HCC uh, has also been investigating and using AI to review evidence, complaints. So could you please, again, tell us about that? Yes, uh, so we, we invested very much in technology-assisted review. And uh, in particular, we, the first case we applied that was one of our major investigations. Um, in November 2019, um, a couple of months after I joined, we uh, did a down rate to all the uh, banks. Uh, in the country, and uh, we collected uh, more than a million uh, documents uh, and emails, which you can imagine, uh, this is quite a lot. Um, and of course, you know that you need a lot of manpower to be able to, to assess that. So this is a, a, an investigation which we started with a more traditional way of reviewing documents. And then, you know, because we have been creating our data science team and we have been trying to think how we can invest better, the use of that time, we uh, really asked them to, uh, to come up with uh, solutions concerning technology-assisted review. And basically, they combine three different types of technology, which I think um, was uh, quite fantastic. So first, they were uh, able to, um, uh, they had to develop some kind of uh, text extraction technology uh, to extract basically text from various files formats, because some of the files were docs, some of the files PDFs, some were Excels, uh, somewhere were emails, and to basically convert all of that to, and the attachments as well, to machine readable text. And then uh, they employed uh, natural language processing methods, techniques, and in particular because many of these emails were written in English, some of them were written in Greek, so you had basically to come up with uh, the Greek uh, type of uh, version, this is a Greek BERT uh, uh, tech, uh, uh, software that they use, to basically clean or norm normalize and do some, uh, at the first level, some semantic analysis of this. Uh, so basically what they did is they uh, provided some embeddings, embeddings with uh, the semantic meaning and the context of the text, and that allowed for effective um, comparison and similarity analysis. So basically they compared the various documents and were able to provide a pairwise similarity scores that were somehow uh, computed. And this uh, identified the attachments that exhibited high similarity to the crucial emails. And at least part of that process, because it's no fully automated process, I mean, you, this is a process that augments the capabilities of the staff, we had basically to come back to, uh, to the staff, return these attachments uh, to do manual inspection by HEC employees. Then the next technology they adopted was graph analysis. So that enabled them to analyze the various corporate entities involved in the emails communications, looking to the, uh, you know, to, 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 to for, from, or CC uh, type of fields uh, in the emails, uh, in the email threads, and, uh, uh, and to use uh, topo you know, topo topography, basically, um, and graph analysis to be able to uh, connect uh, the various networks, uh, social network analysis that, uh, and the communication patterns that existed among the various entities. And there, you know, we use various centrality measures, such as between a centrality or against centrality, to identify the nodes with a high influence uh, and information uh, flow within the graph. And that was very important. Again, you know, we look at the, with the, the stuff that was involved in the investigation to see if the whole story, you know, somehow uh, was compatible with what the, uh, came out as well. And the third technology we used, and that was, I think, pretty happy that we used that, was neural networks models. Uh, so we use neural network models to uh, look basically to the email body classification, and, and that helped determine the relevance and importance of each email in the investigation. And combining the outputs of the neural network model with the result from the graph analysis, as well as the extraction text, we were able, um, and our calculations are that we were able to reduce by 96%, 96% the time that we had spent in the reviewing of these documents. So the investigation ended uh, in 2023, and we settled with a fine of 41.7 million euros for the four, four uh, cent uh, main banks in the retail sector, as well as the banking association. And I think what is interesting here is 
to think about the poten potential of this technology because if you have, for instance, like 10,000 emails, you don't necessarily need to uh, you know, look to the 10,000 emails. You can look to 1,000 emails or even less, uh, train the algorithm, and basically be able to um, get evidence and, and, and focus on the specific type of emails that are of a highly likelihood of anti-competitive uh, conduct. So now that we sold you on the idea of using those technology, we need to talk about the reasons why it is more complicated than it appears to be. Uh, but if you take the five years, seven years we've been mentioning this morning and divide that by 96%, you will see how this could benefit the agency. Now, there are many challenges. One challenge, very obvious, is that if you use unsupervised machine learning, where basically you ask the machine to come up with a result that you did not instruct and cannot explain why the machine came up with that result and the company appeals your decision, good luck explaining that to a judge. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is institutional. We've heard already about expertise, so I want to ask them just one question about those challenges, and then my surprise question. Um, I'll start with you uh, this time around, Yanis. So, um, again, you've done a lot of things at the agency uh, over the years, so I'm curious to hear what was maybe the main challenge that you faced internally, whether in working with employees, developing the tools, uh, dealing with the companies. With regards to computational instruction. Of course, of course. Yeah, but of okay, course. I will just focus on these ones. Okay, so um, <laughs> I would say the most important was to find the right people. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we are small jurisdictions. Um, I mean, very, you know, a lot of talents obviously there, but the, the public service doesn't offer salaries that you're able to attract, um, uh, you know, good people in terms of computer scientists or, um, or software scientists or data scientists. So uh, for us, it was important to convince the legislator that we needed to develop a different approach in terms of recruiting. So we changed our law that enabled us to recruit uh, on a contract basis, a little bit like the chief economist team at the European Commission, right. a chief data scientist uh, mm -hmm. for a period of two plus two years uh, and provide these data scientists full freedom uh, in the sense that he's, he's not actually full-time uh, working at the authority. He can combine uh, the work at the authority with work at the university. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, all consultancy work, which doesn't involve obviously cases that we have to deal with, companies that we have to deal with. So there are strict conflict rules. But I think that was the only way we could attract people, because otherwise we won't be able to attract uh, yeah. people. So I think that was the most important challenge. The second thing is I think it's important to think about all these different tools in terms of and so, okay, in terms of monitoring the markets and, and collecting evidence uh, and assessing technology review of documents, still the, the evidence is documents, mm -hmm. right? So the question is, what will happen in case we, can we actually rely on big data science evidence to make causal inferences uh, in law? And I think there uh, we might have faced some problems with regards to the legal standards of evidence. They're not very different from those that uh, were confronted with the econometrics, for instance, uh, in the past. Uh, but again, you know, the, the, the concept of causality that data scientists have is a little bit different from the one that economists and lawyers have. Lawyers would tend to have a connection, a causal relations between event A and an event B. Mm. That's why, you know, our, somehow uh, our causality is basically a eliminative induction causality. So yeah. we have a bad four test, right? So we eliminate basically a cause and we just select the, the good one. The economists have a different type of causality, which is the enum enumerative induction mm -hmm. type of causality. So we're basically trying to uh, look to, uh, uh, let's say, a specific type of, uh, of, of, of facts, you know, look a little bit to the patterns, see if there's a regularity there, and then maybe, you know, abstract to the level of the population. The data scientists, they have variational induction as a way to think about, about causality. So in a way, you have to uh, establish causal relation by systematically varying the different circumstances of the examined phenomenon and then basically playing a little bit with that to arrive to a causal argument. So I think the difficulty there will be how we can assess and address all these different definitions of causality, how the legal framework might have to be more open. And it has been more open in the, for instance, all the asbestos litigation, uh, the courts have been very open to be demological type of evidence, right? Mm -hmm. So they had to change, they had to, you know, form a different view of causality, and I think this is a little bit what probably the courts should will do. <coughs> that will raise problems with regards to predictive coding, for instance, and mm -hmm. there have been some cases in the U.S. 
and a couple of, uh, in the UK about predicted coding. But I think you know, that would be the, the next challenge for this type of uh, yeah. AI. And so what you mentioned, hiring a chief data scientist that is also working on the side, maybe in the university, was actually what the DOJ had to do, right, with Laura Edelson. She was a postdoc at the time. So this is not just something for Grace. This seems to be a challenge for all agencies. Something else I mentioned is that the AI Act is actually impacting what agencies may be able to do with AI when it comes to reviewing evidence to practices that could be criminal. So also have a look at that. But, so sorry, it's not only the DMA and the DSA, it's also Data Act, AI Act, and so on and so forth. I'll move on to you. Um, the question I wanted to ask is whether or not within your agencies you are of the, the opinion that you should develop your own tool so that you really understand what they do and how they function, or did you also work with other agencies who mentioned that, or private companies? What is the approach that you took? Okay, so I think we share similar challenges in getting the expertise. Uh, so when you want something, you either build it, you buy it, or you borrow it. Uh, and I think in our case, we did a little bit of uh, all of them. Uh, so in the beginning, we started off with a data strategy, and part of that was to make sure that everyone got trained in dealing with data. So everyone got basic training, and uh, you know, officers who are more interested or more uh, apt at uh, quantitative work then got more advanced training. Uh, and actually to set the tone, I also had to sign up for data visualization course. I had to sign up, I signed up for a two day Python programming course and I would confess at the end of two days, I remembered distinctly why I chose law in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, after that training, uh, the officers who like quantitative work, they were then grouped together in a cross-divisional uh, functional group that then took on data projects. And one of their success products was the bit rigging detection tool, which was developed entirely in-house, mm. right? Because they then understood what could be the possible indicators or screening indicators to use. So we developed that in-house and having a sort of a successful product which we could then market to public procurement agencies to use uh, gave us uh, the ability to then subsequently collaborate with another agency, uh, the Government Technology Agency of Singapore, uh, to build the document similarity tool. So we borrowed the expertise in technology to build the tool. Uh, so subsequently with these two tools, we also succeeded in getting manpower as well as funding requests from the parent ministry uh, to build our own data and digital division. Right. So I think it's a step-by-step -step approach, building, buying, borrowing. Yeah. All right, I'm conscious of time, so you will get just one minute to answer my surprise question. You have a different question for each of you. I'll start with you. Um, so usually when discussing those issues, I hear, well, technology will replace humans. And it is, I think maybe to reassure people, you will often hear not at all. And I am convinced of the fact that indeed, if you can combine the two, the expertise and the tools, great. But I would also think that instead of reading those 10,000 emails, well, if the tool can do it, well, maybe you need to hire less interns or at least reallocate what they would do to something else. So my question is this, where do you wish that you can deploy technology within your agency to indeed replace the need for a fully fleshed body human to work on the thing? Okay, I, we do have a voluntary merger notification regime. So the number of notifications that we receive are already quite reduced in number, but we also clear 90% of those merger notifications, right? So if there's a predictive model, an AI model that can help us to very quickly clear merger notifications that you know, don't have a problem, I think that would be ideal. That would be the one, okay. The one for you now. So let's imagine that you are tomorrow once again at the head of an agency, let's call it the DigiComp. <laughs> what would you do when it comes to those issues, but maybe you could take it to a broader level, to take that agency in the worst possible direction? And I'm asking you because then the opposite of that would be a great program, I suppose. In the worst possible direction in terms of uh, investment in computational yeah. technology. Or anything computational related, we have to finish on a very light note, so. Well, um, usually, you know, you are not trying to 
do something worse. <laughs> no. <laughs> is, you know. um, but uh, I would say, I don't know, maybe not intervene at all in markets and have a quiet life of a monopoly competition agency, uh, which uh, has full exclusivity and therefore, you know, uh, no one can, can criticize uh, and basically do nothing. I think that's probably the worst thing you can do. I think yeah. being active is is important uh, for competition authorities. Well, uh, we got a great quote out of that, the quiet life of the exactly. agency. So maybe yeah. the title for a forthcoming book or paper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Bundeskartelamt is definitely not the quiet agency. So again, thank you very much for having us. And I think the time is uh, now for the thank concluding you. words. Thank you.